today we're going to read through 2 Samuel 8 and 9. These two chapters, 8 and 9, they stand together to reinforce complementing themes, much like our study last week on 2 Samuel 6 and 7. Last week, 2 Samuel 6 and 7 were two chapters that drove home two themes, worship and prayer. And the two chapters stood together in such a way that they complemented one another and they reinforced each other. Well, our chapters today, eight and nine, are doing the same thing. They are complementing themes that help us see something clearer. And that thing that we're supposed to see are themes of the king. Now, we've been going through 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. Today in chapter eight, we're well into the story of David taking Uh, the reigns of the kingdom of Israel. He's now been crowned as king over all of Israel, not just Judah, but the whole nation. One of the first things he did was he brought the ark back. It was a, a, a study on worship. And then he desired to build a house for God. And God said, I'm not gonna build a house for you, or I don't want you to build a house for me. I'm gonna build a house for you. And he gave David a covenant, a promise that he was going to establish him and his lineage forever. That it was going to be a throne that would reign forever. Now on the heels of that, David began to pray and thank God. Right after that thanking, that boldness of what God said he was gonna do through David, we pick up in chapter eight, and we're gonna find that because of what David saw and knew about God, it emboldened him to take new steps as the king in Israel. But before we do that, before we get into the text, I want us to consider why the author would do that kind of stuff. Why does the author arrange in these chapters, well, he didn't put the chapters, we added the chapters later, but why does he arrange these themes in these chapters in such a way that they complement and reinforce each other? Well, the first reason is historical. The people living at the period of time that this was written, it was needed for the Israelites because they needed a record of the history of their people. It was important that the people of God knew the story of God and they were familiar with David and that's why it went beyond just oral tradition and it went into actually writing it down. They recorded this, they wrote the book of 2 Samuel and they recorded these events of David but it is much more than just a historical account. What it also did was it prepared in the hearts of the people a foreshadow of what David did, that there would be a coming Messiah who would function with the same kind of themes that this King David functioned in. But it's not just restricted to David, that's just where we're zooming in today. As you read through the entire uh, Hebrew Bible, what you're gonna find is these, these themes that keep popping up throughout the story of who this Messiah figure is going to be. If you just do a word study in the Bible on the word Messiah, you're not going to get a full picture of everything that Jesus would embody as he would come as king. You have to dig into the story and understand that when, when Moses is doing what he's doing during the Exodus, that is a foreshadow or a type or a theme of what the Messiah would do. He was going to set people free from bondage. Okay, so what we're looking for in the theme of the Messiah, what we're preparing our hearts for for this coming king is that he's going to be like a Moses figure, but he's not just gonna be like a Moses figure. He's also gonna be like a Joshua figure. He's gonna lead God's people into a promised land. He's gonna establish land. He's gonna establish rest for his people, but he's not just gonna be like a Joshua figure. He's gonna be like a prophet figure. He's going to proclaim God's word to God's people. He's gonna call out where they're in sin and say, you have to stop doing that. We're kicking you out. He's gonna say, this is exactly what God wants you to do. I want you to keep doing that. He was a prophet, but he's not just that. As you read through some of the prophets, you understand that this theme of what this king would be would also be a suffering servant. This servant who would shoulder the sins of his own people and let them abuse him. He would take their sins upon himself. But since we're in 2 Samuel, one of the themes that we're driving home today and what the author wants us to see is the themes of the king. He will not just be 
a Moses figure or a Joshua figure or a prophet or a suffering servant. He will not just be the son of man as Daniel speaks of him, but he will also be a king. But what kind of king will this man be? Because we've seen kings across the earth and we see how kings function. Is this king going to be like the king that we see in in Babylon? Is this king gonna be like the kings that we've seen in Israel? Is he gonna be like Saul? What's he gonna be like? This is what the author is trying to get us to understand. Through the lens of the historic man of David, you can see these two specific themes of this king foreshadowing what the coming king Jesus would be. And these two themes are that the king would be a conquering king, but that he would also be a generous king. That's the two, that is the, the, the thrust of these two chapters. The author wants us to behold the two key themes of David. He was a conquering warrior king, but he was also tender and gentle. And those two things foreshadow the coming king, Jesus. So our responsibility today as we go through the text is to familiarize ourselves with the historical account of David as a conquering king and a generous king, but also not just stop at David, but behold what the text is portraying to us about the coming King Jesus, so that as we worship Jesus, we're not just worshiping one theme or one side of his personality. You can't afford to just walk around and say, man, my Jesus is just a kind, loving Jesus and he's down for anything. Jesus is my homeboy. We're best friends. Well, part of that is true. He is your friend, but he is also your king. He is gentle and humble and lowly and he will get on his hands and knees and wash his disciples' feet, but he will also come back with fire in his eyes and a sword in his mouth. And if you only behold your favorite aspect of the king and elevate that above all other biblically declared themes of the king, you ultimately will end up worshiping a false Jesus. You are not worshiping the true king if you are only worshiping the qualities of him that you like. You are remolding him in your own image and you are worshiping an idol. You are not worshiping the king. That is what is on the line and that's why it's so important. Because these two themes stand next to each other in these chapters because they want, the author wants us to understand the importance of beholding the fullness of Jesus and not just a couple qualities that we like and we're okay with. There are qualities of our king that you won't like, that will rub against you, they will demand things of you, And if you don't lay those things down, that you're not actually following him. Cool? All right, let's get into it. 2 Samuel chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 1. And these two chapters are pretty short, so I'm just going to read through uh, 8 all the way. Then we'll go back and talk about it, and then we'll read through 9, and then we'll talk about it. So 2 Samuel 8, 1 through 18. Now after this, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them. Now that, the first two words, after this, they key us in on the fact that this event took place right after he was humbled in prayer before the Lord because the Lord said, I'm gonna establish your kingdom. All right, what I see about you gives me confidence. If you're going to establish your kingdom through, through me and through my family lineage, I now have boldness to go out and spread this kingdom that you're putting in my heart outside of these four walls. After this, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them. And David took meth eg ama, which is a kind of a, a code word or a nickname for the town of Gath, which was a Philistine stronghold. He took it out of the hand of the Philistines. He defeated Moab and he measured them with a line. Making them lie down on the ground, two lines he measured to be put to death and one full line to be spared. And the the ones who were spared, the Moabites, became servants to David and brought tribute. That's exactly what it sounds like. He took everybody, he laid them down on the ground, he drew a line, and he said, these two-thirds are being put to death, and we're going to spare this one-third, and you're going to be now brought in under the Davidic kingdom. 
Verse 3, David also defeated Hadadazer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, as he went to restore his power at the river Euphrates. And David took from him 1,700 horsemen and 20,000 foot, sh- foot soldiers. And David hamstrung all the chariot horses, but left enough for 100 chariots. And when the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadazer, king of Zobah, David struck down 22,000 men of the Syrians. And David put garrisons in Aram of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants to David and brought tribute. And the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. And David took the shields of gold that were carried by the servants of Hadadazer and brought them to Jerusalem. And from Batah and from Barothai, the cities of Hadadazer, King David took very much bronze. When Toi, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated the whole army of Hadadazer, Toi sent his son Joram to King David and asked about his health and to bless him because he had fought against Hadadazer and defeated him for Hadadazer had often been at war with Toi. And Joram brought with him articles of silver, of gold, and of bronze. These also King David dedicated to the Lord together with the silver and gold that he dedicated from all the nations he subdued, from Edom, Moab, the Ammonites, the Philistines, Amalek, and from the spoil of Hadad Ezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah. And David made a name for himself when he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. And then he put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom, he put garrisons. And all the Edomites became, became David's servants. And the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. So David reigned over all Israel. And David administered justice and equity to all his people. Joab, the son of Zariah, was over the army. And Jehoshaphat, the son of Elihud, was recorder Zadok, the son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, the son of Abathar, they were priests, and Sariah was secretary. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and David's sons were priests. Now, usually what I'll do is I'll go back up to verse one and we'll work our way through, but let's do it backwards today because the last verse is a little controversial. So let's start with the controversies first. Verse 18 says that David's sons were priests. Now this creates a little bit of an issue. And the reason why it creates an issue is because David isn't from the tribe of Levi. David is from the tribe of Judah. Judah aren't priests. The Levites aren't priests. The Levites are priests. And so David doesn't really have any business making his sons priests if his family line isn't from the priesthood. Now there's two ways to interpret this. And most commentators that I looked up this week, this week, they kind of just split it right down the line. So you get to choose. There's no wrong one. Okay. Here's the two ways that you can look at this. One, you can look at it through the lens or the light of Hebrews 5 and Hebrews 7. And that is the argument that there is another priesthood that supersedes and is actually greater than the Levitical priesthood. And it is the priesthood by the order of Melchizedek. It predates the Levitical priesthood. In fact, the way that the writer of Hebrews argues it, because uh, the ancestors, the, the, the forefather of the Levite priests tithed to, Mel- tithed to Melchizedek, it was a way of the priesthood of the Levites affirming that this other Melchizedek priesthood was actually superior to the Levitical priesthood. So one argument could be that David set his sons up as priests, not in the Levitical priesthood, but in a greater other priesthood, the order of Melchizedek, who was also the king of Salem, which is now Jerusalem. The other interpretation comes from uh, 1 Chronicles 18, 17. This exact same account is recorded in the book of 1 Chronicles. And in 18, 17, we're told that David's sons weren't priests, they were actually chief officials in the service of the king. That's what Chronicles says. So when 
Kings said they were priests. They may have held the title of priests, but they didn't function like Levitical priests. They were considered priests, but their duties were to serve King David. They were functioning chief officials in his court. All right, so that kind of cleans up a little bit of the mess. As you're reading through this, you're like, why is David taking liberties that doesn't seem to be liberties that he should be taking? Well, there's two interpretations that don't violate him doing that. But the other one, the other issue, and I'm going to argue that probably most of you in this church, this is not going to be an issue. Okay? You'll, you'll understand why in a minute. There's a little bit of a, a blue collar sandpaper side to us, and so this probably isn't going to rub you the wrong way. But um, in more tender churches, I'll say, <laughs> soft churches, uh, churches where the, the, the priests might actually wear like a, a rainbow. I'll stop. Um, <laughs> there seems to be a violation, verses 2 through 7, and verses 12 through 14, David is doing nothing but conquering regions and expanding his kingdom. Now, why would that be a violation? Why would we have an, an issue with that? Because, my God, David's an imperialist. How dare you come into a foreign land with your army and tell them that what they're doing is wrong? Who do you think you are? To get a sense of scale for what David is actually doing, I want to show you a map of some of these places because when the author starts listing these things in verse 12, Edom, Moab, Ammonites, the Philistines, Amalek, it's really difficult to get a sense of where some of these places are. So I want to kind of help you with that. So as usual, here's the world map. We're going to zoom in on this region. We're going to zoom wider than we normally do. But some of these places are still familiar. You've got the Mediterranean Sea over here. You've got uh, the Dead Sea over here. Sea of Galilee is up here in the north. This is where Jerusalem is. Damascus is called out in the story. That's why I put it up there. But the thing I really want you to grasp is where all these different tribes are. Now, uh, two weeks ago, I showed you a map of David's kingdom when he came into the kingdom and where all the tribes were. And now, so most of those tribes are right here in this area that we would call Israel, overlapping some of Philistia, uh, Philistia, but Judah is down here. And then most of the Northern tribes are up here around Galilee. So this chunk of land is Israel. But what we find today as David starts conquering land and expanding the kingdom, he's actually expanding way down here into the Sinai Peninsula. He's coming over here into what is uh, modern day Jordan, over here Moab, Edom, Amalek, Philistia, but he's actually traveling north up here to Zo uh, Zobah, up to Aram. He, he's traveling very, very far north over into Ammon. He's conquering all these regions. So now after David starts expanding his kingdom, Israel is not here. Israel is all here. This entire section of land is now under Israelite control. Now, as you read this, and you start considering, well, that just seems offensive. Why, why would David do that? Why would he come in and continue to expand his kingdom? His kingdom? Is, he, is he just uh, some kind of ruler who wants more land? Well, there's something you need to understand about these surrounding nations. These surrounding, surrounding nations, they were wicked people. And I'm not talking like in like our modern sense of, of wicked. Uh, I'm talking about like in the, the 1000 BC sense of wicked. These nations regularly participated in child sacrifices and killing children. They participated regularly in demon worship, in, idol in forms of idolatry. If you were a woman in these societies, you had no power. If you were a child in these societies, it was even worse for you. If you were a female child, you had no hope. You were used regularly. The idea that David would expand his kingdom is only offensive because we live in a culture today that would call evil good and good evil. We live in a culture where we see things and say, well, you don't know that person's story. You don't know why they would do those things. 
We have lost this sense that there is a thing called the right thing to do. Because my right thing might not be your right thing. And so we muddy the waters and we're, uh, we approach texts like this and there's a thing inside of us that gets offended because we see a man expanding his kingdom and we don't see the other kingdoms that he's conquering. We see David as a, a man who's just hoarding land and not as a man who is establishing a new and superior and better kingdom. The idea that King David would be a conquering king who would expand his land is understood in light of verse 15. I'm gonna read it to you. David reigned over all Israel. Now, I just showed you the map. What's all Israel now? Amon, the Philistines, the Amalekites, all of those people are now under Davidic rule and they're part of Israel. They're foreigners that are paying tribute, but the way King David does things, he expects those kingdoms that are now under his control to function like they do in Jerusalem. So how do they function in Jerusalem? David reigned over all his people, and David administered justice and equity to all his people. So David conquered a region, and how did he rule? What did he bring into these foreign lands that were so riddled with demonic worship and corrupt government that were just completely from the top to the bottom, saturated with sexual immorality and the abuse of women and the mutilation of children? What did he do to these foreign entities, these nations, that gave themselves over to the modern social culture of the day, that just gave their eyes to anything that, that, that entertainment would throw their way? They believed any lie that was being presented before them. What did David do when he came in? He came in and he established justice and equity where there was previously no justice and no equity. Now what is justice and equity? Because if you ask the average person walking down the street in, I don't know, San Francisco, you're gonna get a different answer of what justice and equity would be that is presented to us in scripture. So if we're gonna start diving into these terms, we have to define the terms. And the terms are rooted in Hebrew words, not English words, so they're gonna tell us what they mean. We're not bringing meaning to them. So when we're told that David established justice and equity, the word justice is a Hebrew word, mishpat. Now if you've stayed with us in our Isaiah message series, some of this is gonna be familiar. Because justice is mishpat, and equity is sadaka. But there's two words that are close to those words. There's a word that's close to justice, but it's actually a word that means bloodshed. Justice is mishpat, and bloodshed is mizpah. And Isaiah was prophesying to the people of Israel, the Lord says he's looking across the land and he's looking for mishpat, but all he sees is mizpah. He's looking for justice, but all he sees is bloodshed. And the two words are real close together, and it's easy to confuse them because they sound the same, but if you keep redefining these words, then the thing that is right will never be done among you. So the first thing David does when he comes in is he establishes justice and equity. And justice is nothing more than the practice of making things right. That's justice. If something is wrong, you make it right. That's justice. And he also establishes equity, sadaka. Now that Hebrew word can also be translated not as just equity, but it's also translated other in other places in the Old Testament as righteousness. So when when David comes in, he establishes 
the practice of making things right, but he also establishes sadaka, equity, which is the practice of doing the right thing. See, that's, that's different than our culture. If you ask the average person today, what is equity, they would tell you, well, equity is making sure that those people who don't have what they need to come and sit at the table, you give them a leg up and they come over here and they, they get a benefit so they can come over here. And also for those who are already sitting at the table who, who have some benefit that they're either removed from the table or their benefit is taken away so that everyone is equal sitting at the table, that's equity. That's not equity. Equity is doing the right thing, making things equal, righteousness. Equity is making sure that nobody gets an extra uh, helping just to get them ahead. And also nobody is using the extra that they have to abuse those who have nothing. Equity is looking at every human being as an image bearer and doing the right thing according to God's standard. You follow? This is what David brought in. Now we look at this and and we see uh, things out of balance in our culture and we're like, okay, let's go to the smartest minds, let's go to colleges, let's let's ask professors, people who are studying this, let's ask them to tell us what we need to do to fix our society. And it's funny, they always come up with the same ideas. And none of it is rooted in the idea that we are image bearers and we should be doing the right thing. What is the right thing? Well, the right thing is what the word of God tells us is the right thing. Not with somebody with seven degrees who tells us is the right thing because their heart is fallen and there is sin in their heart and the the, 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 um, options that they bring to the table are just as fallen as the people who has uh, a, a hidden agenda inside of them where all they want is to continue to build more wealth and take advantage of the people of the earth. Do you see how broken the system is if we just kind of push this thing like out of the way? David understood this because it wasn't just happening. Look, it's, it's, it's not just happening in our time. It was happening back then too. And the reason why it's happening more and more and more in our time is because the stuff that happened back then, it didn't go away. It just reworked the play and it's trying something new. The enemy is running the same plays he has always run. And that is to Take the image of God and mutilate it. To destroy it, to break it. That's the enemy's desire. He wants to take God's creation and burn it to the ground. And he doesn't matter where he starts. He'll start with your phone, he'll start with a movie, he'll start with somebody at work, He'll start with your thought life. He'll start with the news that you watch. He'll start in science. He'll start in the humanities. He's got his tentacles in history. He's got, he's got his influence in, in entertainment, uh, in, in fashion, in, in video games, um, in, in, in government, in education. It doesn't matter where you look, the prince of the power of the air is at work doing the same things he's always done, just running new versions of it. And David understood this. And so the first thing he did when he came in and conquered these nations is that he established justice and equity. From now on, every piece of land, every grain of sand that is under my rule is going to do the right thing. And if, it, and, and if someone doesn't do the right thing, then we're going to fix it and make sure that we make that right. David established justice and equity. Now, as I said before, this kind of rubs against our modern sensibilities, not your sensibilities, but our modern sensibilities. Because how dare a foreign colonizing imperial king come in and tell us the way we should be thinking and the way we should be doing things. There's just one problem. This theme of the conquering king 
is a foreshadow of exactly what Jesus Christ did when he came and died and rose from the grave. If you have a problem with the sense that a foreign king would come in and establish right when you already think you know what right is, you're gonna have a big problem with Jesus. Because he is a conquering king over his creation and what he did by establishing his rule over the earth is he told, he told every ruler and every king right down to, the, to the, the 19-year-old who's wearing a tiny little Burger King crown thinking he's running his own life. The king of glory has come in and said, you're no king, young man. Take that crown off your head and follow me. Let me give you some scripture to back it up. Colossians 2.15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Mark 3.27, we're told when Jesus is discussing about the understanding of, of what it takes to come in and, and conquer a house, the first thing you have to do is come in and bind the strong man. You familiar with that? Mark 3.27, our king has bound the strong man of death, hell, the grave, and has conquered the greatest enemy known to man, which is sin. He's a conquering king. I'll give you another one. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. We're told that Daniel saw in night visions, behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days. And he was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. We serve a King Jesus who is a conquering king, and when he conquers, he establishes justice and equity. When he shows up on the scene, he tells everyone now under his rule, you will do the right thing. And if you don't, you will be under my judgment. And for those who have already done the wrong thing, those things need to be made right. But here's the most fascinating part about this. In the same way that David took the throne as a conquering king and expanded the kingdom on a regular basis, he then put Joab, Jehoshaphat, Zadok, his sons, as stewards over this kingdom to make sure that from the top to the bottom, every corner of this kingdom is functioning by doing the right thing, and if nobody is, making it right. And in the same way, this is what we're beholding. We're beholding a king, King David, who functioned with this thing, uh, theme of a conquering king that is now forecasting to us the rule and reign of Jesus Christ, who has also put his sons and daughters as stewards over this king that he is now kingdom, he is now ruling over, and it is our responsibility to make sure that in our own hearts, in our own families, in our own churches, and the cities we live in, we are functioning in a way that we are doing the right thing. And if somebody isn't, we're going to make it right. Which is important because that means that you don't just go to work and go home and work long enough to draw a pension and then live fat and happy and ignore the rest of your life. The idea of the ever-expanding, conquering King Jesus means that his people who are under his rule are now finding ways to get connected into the society and the cities they live in to make the cities that they live in better. To make the places that you work better to encourage that the people you work with do the right thing. And if somebody isn't, then you would go out of your way to make it right. The ever-expanding nature of the kingdom of God when Christ rose from the dead 
We see it in the gospel being spread across the globe. We see it in the transformed lives of individuals like you and me, now being sent by the Great Commission, go out and make disciples. But don't just go out and make disciples, go out and get invested in the cities that you live in. Spread the, gospels at, spread the gospel at work, spread the gospel at school, spread the gospel with your neighbors. You are not just planted where you're planted for no purpose whatsoever. You are there as an ambassador of the king to make his ways known among all the people you come in contact with. That is why we are here. And it all rests under this umbrella, this theme of the conquering king. Now, some of you, they're like, yes, I can get behind that. Most people don't know this, but I, I do own a sword at home. I own a lot of knives. I like shooting. I like camping. I'm, I'm a manly man. I like, when you talk to me about the conquering king, I'm here for it. Beard and all. Let's go. We should chop some wood together after church. I'm here for the conquering king. I like that message. But these two themes are paired with, that, that theme is paired with something else. I'm here for, for manly men, burly men, men who protect their families, men who protect women. I'm here for that. Conquering kings, men who are not, they, they couldn't defend their wife against an old lady. I'm not here for that. I'm here for men who, who are strong and are confident and protect their families and protect God's church. But there's another side to this, strong, burly men. And these themes have to live alongside of each other because if all you have is the conquering king, then you miss the first way that Christ came to us, which is the humble, the broken, the generous king. So these two have to stand next to each other. So understanding that means we have to read the next chapter, Second King, excuse me, 2 Samuel chapter nine. So after all of this conquering, David sitting on his throne, David says, verse nine, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show kindness, show, that I may show the kindness of God to him? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. And the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Mahir, the son of Amiel at Lodibar. And King David sent and brought him from the house of Mahir, the son of Amiel at Lodibar and Mephibosheth the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth? And he said, behold, I am your servant. And David looked at him right in his eyes and said, do not fear. I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you will eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, what is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? And the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, all that belong to Saul and all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. 
And Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. The conquering King David and the generous King David. The generous King David who is establishing justice and equity to everyone in his kingdom, even children under the foreign enemy regime. He calls this young man in and he says, if something's not right, I'm going to make it right. I made a promise to your dad 15, 20 years ago. It was back in 1 Samuel 20, verse 15. I made a promise to your son, that, to your dad, that I would always care for his household. And I understand, Mephibosheth, that what has been done to you is not your fault. You were, you were sinned against. Your legs are broke and it's not your fault. But because of that, you have taken on an entire persona and personality. The very core of who you are has been shaped by what has been done to you. And now you're living in Lodabar, which is some town that basically means low, depressed, absent, the lowest you could possibly get. It's a Hebrew word that basically means nowhereville. Nobody knows your name. Your only ancestors are those who were under the enemy regime of David, and all of your ancestors have been killed. Your dad's been killed. All of your uncles have been killed. Your grandfather's been killed. You have nobody. And David looks at him and says, son, do not fear, because you do have somebody. You, for the rest of your life, is going to you're gonna sit right here at my table and you're gonna eat. I can't fix your legs, but I can change your status. I can change who you are. I can call your name and change the way everyone sees you. You're gonna be abundant and fruitful and you're gonna have a seat at my table for as long as you live. Mephibosheth went from a man who had no family, no status, to a man with a home, abundant blessings, and a seat at the king's table, all because not something Mephibosheth did, but something the generous king did. And this telegraphs to us a theme about the king that we call Jesus. How are we supposed to understand what kind of king is this Messiah going to be? What kind of king is this Jesus going to be? He's going to be a conquering king, but he's going to be a generous king. Let me give you some scripture to back this up. Colossians 1, 19 through 22. I didn't give these to the team ahead of time so that you could see them because I want you to just listen to them. Even if you have to close your eyes to listen, I want you to hear what Paul is saying about this generous king. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, has now been reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Here's another one, Ephesians 2. You were dead in your trespasses, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among who we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and in the mind, were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Verse six, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Church, you were Mephibosheth. 
You are the one with no past, no family, no home, no name, crippled in spirit and maybe even in body. And Christ called your name. He healed your body and gave you a seat at his table forever. Church, I want you today, as we're reading 2 Samuel 8 and 9, to behold the conquering king, but also the generous king. I want you to behold it for the fact that it is worthy of beholding and nothing else. If, this, if, I'm just, if I were to stop right now, that is enough for you to hear that our king is a conquering king and a generous king. That is enough for you to behold for the rest of the week. But the author wrote this story, not just so the people would know and behold, but so that the people would embody what they beheld. It is enough to just see it and know it. But the story doesn't just stop there at seeing and knowing because you become like what you worship. You are molded by what you behold. And what the author wants us to do through the power of the Holy Spirit is see these qualities of David telegraphed into the qualities of Christ so that when you behold Christ and you see that he is a conquering king and you see that he is a generous king, you don't just say, praise God, that is marvelous. I don't know what to do next. (laughs) You behold these qualities of the king so that you walk away transformed by them. This is important. Knowing that Jesus is a king who conquers sheds light on your life and helps you understand that the ever-expanding nature of God's kingdom means that there is no corner of your life that's gonna be remained untouched by him. Hear me. It means the ever-expanding kingdom of God is out there. When he took his seat in heaven at the right hand of the Father, we are told from the Bible that he is ruler over all of the world. Every people, tribes, nations, even people that reject him, he's still ruling over them. Whether you even believe he exists or not, doesn't matter. He is king over you. So the ever-expanding nature of his kingdom is seen in the expansion of the gospel, is seen in the reality that his kingdom is spreading across the earth, and that one day the enemy is doomed, and there's nothing he can do about it. But the other component of this ever-expanding kingdom is that it is ever-expanding in your life, and in your heart, and in your family, and in your mind. And just when you think you've got to the peripheral of what this kingdom boundary is, you look beyond it and see that there's another pasture that he wants to expand into. There are corners of your heart. See, some of you have surrendered to some things that he has asked of you, but there are corners of your heart, your past, feelings that you have, tendencies towards anger, your desire to just get short about things that don't really matter, your desire to want to gossip and share information that that isn't true or is not uh, helpful to be shared. This desire you have inside of you to indulge your flesh by watching things that are unfruitful and unhelpful to you. Everything from pornography to to just just fear and, and scary stuff. Some of you, you have surrendered yourself to to Jesus, and when you come to church, you love God, but you are secretly, without anybody knowing, dabbling around in drugs, recreationally, playing around with pot. Messing around with, uh, with, with, I don't know, a bunch of drugs, okay? So I'm not going to list a bunch of drugs. But so, so, and as soon as I said, I was like, you don't know any other drugs. Why are you? I'm trying to be relevant, guys. Maybe, it, maybe it's not drugs. Maybe it's just alcohol. Maybe your desire, the way that you love, that it makes you, it tastes on your lips, and the way that it just kind of gives you that buzz, that it makes you forget things. You, don't, you hate your job, and so the first thing you do when you get home is you sit your rear end on the couch, and you grab a beer, and you ignore your wife and your children because she's making dinner, and you just stare at the TV. But man, you come to church, and you love God, and you serve on this team, and you help out here, and you read this, but co- come on. The ever-expanding, conquering nature of Jesus means there is no area of your life that's going to be remain untouched by his kingdom. 
And you got to get down with that or take a hike. You need to leave because this isn't here. This isn't for you. If you're not here for Christ to overtake and conquer every corner, every grain of sand in your mind and in your heart and in your hobbies, you might as well walk, you might as well walk away now. You're only making it harder on yourself because he wants all of it. But I got good news for you. He's not an evil king. He's a kind and gracious king. He's the kind of king that when he takes over, he removes that unrighteousness from you and he replaces it with righteousness. He gives you his righteousness. He starts changing the wicked ways that you are so used to with righteous, good, and right ways. And he's kind and he's generous about it. And what he's offering is not to just come in and rule your life, but to come in and rule your life so that you also have a seat at his table. So this is the beauty of 2 Samuel 8 and 9, that we are given a picture of a king named David who functioned with these two themes, conquering and generosity, but they don't just stand at 1,000 B.C. in the timeline of the world. They project to us and prepare in our heart the reality that that is the kind of king that we serve, and he wants all of your life, and when he gets it, he's gonna be kind and gentle and generous. Now, that isn't to say that it will always feel good. It won't. Sometimes it's gonna hurt worse than anything you could possibly imagine. But in going through the hurt and the pain, you are promised by the king who conquers all that that seat at the table is filled with abundance and joy and blessing. And probably the reason why it's gonna hurt is because he's trying to remove from you some desire that you don't need to have for yourself. Because inside of our bones, we want things that aren't good for us. We're born with that desire to want things that don't belong to us, are not given to us, that our Heavenly Father doesn't want us to have, but we want them so badly, and that's why it's difficult. That's why it's painful, because we have a hard time letting go. But here's the good news. Today, Scripture has given us a picture of a king who is not gonna stop until he has all of you, and that you are a spotless bride but he's kind and he's gentle and he's generous. Just don't wait too long because his generosity does have an expiration date. Hear me. And this is the beauty. We started with a conquering king in eight and in nine we got to the generous king. And the way that Christ revealed his themes were inverted. First he came as the generous humble king that let his own creation crucify him. But what we're getting next is the conquering king. He's already on the move, but we're told that one day soon he's gonna crack the sky and come back. And when that sky cracks, it is too late. And if you've been playing church, thinking I'll make a decision about what to do with Jesus in a year from now, or I've got plenty of time. I got bad news for you. You don't have plenty of time. You're not promised this afternoon. So take the picture of Christ seriously because he is kind, but he is serious. Let's pray. Thank you.